Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. We've talked about the story of Adam and Eve. We've talked about Cain and Abel. We're going to keep looking at the Bible in the book of Genesis and see these stories and see God's character throughout these stories. And our main Bible verse for this series is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, where it says this. It says, by faith, everybody say faith. faith. It says, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We see that by faith that we understand the universe was formed by the word of God. This is our starting point. If we can't agree on this as Christians, then we have no foundation. If God, if Jesus Christ is not the creator of the heavens and the earth, then we are all wasting our time here today. Is anybody glad that we understand by faith that Jesus Christ is the creator of the heavens of the earth? Before we begin today, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to look into your word. Lord, I thank you that your word has the power to transform hearts. So Lord, I pray today if there's anybody that's hurting in their heart, God, that has a hardness in your heart, Lord, I thank you by the power of your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit that our hearts would be open, our eyes would be open to see what you're doing and what you're speaking into our lives today. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Quick question. Has anyone here ever had a moment where they were connected to someone that like you were their favorite? Like you found favor in their eyes. And now let me ask the opposite. Have you ever been in a moment when you're around someone and you know they just have it out for you? <laughs> Everyone's like, yes, yes, yes. You know the feeling of what it's like when you're minding your own business, you're working, and your supervisor's just looking for something to catch you like. What time do you clock in? And you're a Christian, but you want to be smart too. So you say, 8.59, in other words, on time. <laughs> you understand what it's like when someone is trying to have it out for you. But on the flip side, the opposite of that is amazing. It's amazing when you don't have to earn someone's favor. They just have it on you. I remember when I was younger and I would think about my life, especially when I was in, I was in elementary school. I was around six or seven at the time. I was living life as a king. It's like, you think you want to get older and have all this stuff one day? No, just give me my bag of Doritos and let me watch my show. <laughs> like as kids, we got to live as kings and queens. And I was living in a house with a man named Jim. And I remember this man, Jim, he would always take great care of me. I remember if I ever wanted food or a snack or a drink, I would always just go to Jim and whatever I asked for, he would give to me. Now, Jim always was eating breakfast. Every morning I come downstairs, he's eating his breakfast, drinking his orange juice. And one day I come downstairs and I see that Jim is eating a bagel. Now, I like bagels, but this wasn't just any bagel. This bagel was a chocolate bagel. Or so a child thinks when they see a bagel that looks like chocolate. And I go over to Jim like, Jim. Can I have a piece of that chocolate bagel? And he looks at me with a smirk. He, smirk. he was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, I love chocolate. And I get a piece of this chocolate bagel, and I eat this chocolate bagel, and my mouth is like, oh, my God. That day I learned about a demon known as pumpernickel. The nastiest flavor. I think if you look at the story of Adam and Eve, it was a pumpernickel tree that they ate from. Because there's no reason to be consuming that. And I remember with Jim that day, I was like, all right, we're not doing the chocolate bagels anymore. But it didn't matter after that moment. Even though I reacted a certain way, I still had favor with him. Not only did I have favor with him in terms of where I was staying and living, it was always the food. If I needed a ride somewhere, remember, I'm a child at this time. And then it goes beyond that. 
Looking at my life backwards, I remember we would go to this woman's house for more food. Clearly, I enjoy food. Her name was Sister Davy, and she would feed us every single week. Every single week, she would have favor on our family. Every single week, she would send us home with trays of food. And as a six-year-old, I'm like, man, everybody loves our family. It's like wherever we go, we're getting whatever we need. Now, you know what I didn't know at the time? I had no idea that we were homeless. No idea that we were homeless. Living life as a king. Living life with unmerited favor. It didn't matter what was going on in the world around me because I had favor with the people that I was connected to. And as you look in the story of Noah, we see a man who was in a world where he's surrounded by chaos and problems. But we see that that chaos didn't matter, not because of what he could do, but because of who he was connected to. I want to be very clear before we jump into the, today's story that there was nothing that I could do as a six-year-old to earn the favor of the people who are around me. If you've ever had a six-year-old, you realize that they contribute joy, but not much in the financial realm. Can a parent say amen? And we see that as we look at this story of Noah and the flood, that the way that Noah's story starts, it doesn't start with saying how amazing Noah is. It doesn't start by saying all the stuff that he did in his own. It starts with a problem, and then we see a solution. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says this. It says that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now picture that for one moment. Everyone look around the room. Look around the room. Now imagine if every single person on your left and your right only had evil in their heart. That you're in church and you're enjoying this sermon and someone's hand is in your purse trying to get your credit card. Trying to see what kind of car you have so that they can unlock and steal from it, take your car home. This is the world that Noah was living in where everybody's heart was set only on evil. Verse 6, it says that the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Verse 7, so the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Everybody say, there's a problem. We see that humanity is completely disconnected from the heart of God, completely separate from the things that God would have them do. But verse 8 has this amazing sentence, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, there was chaos going, around, going on around him. Yes, I grew up and I had no idea that there was chaos going on around me. But in the same way that I had favor with those who are around me, we see that Noah finds favor in the eyes of the Lord. The Hebrew word for favor here is a word chen. And it can be translated favor, but it literally means grace. So we understand that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And as we observe all these Bible heroes and these Bible stories, and we see all the amazing things that these men of God did with God's power, we have to first understand that before they were able to build anything great, that God was building them up by his grace. That the foundation of everything that they did was not their own ability, it was the ability of God who first found them. We see in these Bible stories that we're studying through this series and in other ones that it's very easy to look at all the hard work that goes on. We see that Noah had to build a massive ark if you know the story. We see that Noah spent a long time in preparation. But sometimes we forget that before Noah ever picked up a tool to build an ark, that God found his grace and he covered him, that Noah found favor in the eyes of God. 
If you don't know what grace is, grace is simply God's unmerited or God's unearned favor. That in the same way as a child, I can do nothing to earn favor of those around me. That as children of God, there's nothing that we can do to earn God's grace. And if you have this mindset that I'm not moving forward or God's not happy with me, God's disappointed in me because of all the wrong things, it was never about your actions. It was always about his character. And we understand that God doesn't change. So when we see that Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord, we see in this story that this is now the foundation for how we look at the rest of it. Everybody say this with me. Say grace is Noah's foundation. Verse 9, it says that this is the account of Noah and his family. Remember in Genesis 1, 1, like this is the account of the heavens and the earth. And now we're getting a smaller account within that larger narrative. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah walks faithfully with with God. In scripture, when it says that people are walking with God, it's giving us the image of what a relationship looks like. That when Noah, it says that he walked with God, it's not just referring to his physical legs, but it's referring to the life that he is living. And we see that in the midst of this evil generation, that Noah is there, and it says that he walks with God. And then it says in verse 12, that God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people of, on earth had corrupted their ways. So we see here in this story, as we do in other stories, that in the midst of an evil generation, that in the midst of people turning from God, that God has what's called a remnant. Everybody say remnant. That there is always someone who is going to be there to do what God needs to be done. And what's amazing about these stories is that God, he's all powerful. He can do it all on his own, but he decides to use people like you and me to help build his kingdom. And we see in verse 18 that as Noah is walking, after he finds grace, finds favor with God, what happens when God goes back to him in verse 18? God says to Noah, but I will establish my covenant with you. but I will establish my covenant with you. Who's the one that's establishing this covenant? And who's the one that is faithful to make sure that that covenant happens? It is God. So when God goes to Noah and says, here's the covenant I'm establishing with you, it's a guarantee. He says to him, here's the covenant I'm gonna establish with you. You will enter the ark And you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you, how many of you you realize that your covenant with God, it also affects those who are around you? It also connects with the people that you're connected to. He says, you are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive. So we see here that it is God who initiates the covenant. And as I was studying for this sermon, there's seven covenants in the Bible. You know what they all have in common? God initiates them, that God goes to humanity, and he says, here's what I'm going to do for you. Now he gives us responsibilities, but every covenant, every covenant promise is a guarantee in Jesus Christ. So we see that these covenants are generally God's way of establishing relationship with his people. And what's beautiful about covenant is that God always pays the bill. That in every covenant in scripture that God goes and he makes it happen, eventually with his son, Jesus Christ. And what we see in this story is that when Noah finds favor or finds grace with God, and then God comes to Noah again and he lays out this covenant in front of him, We see that Noah is now in a position to do what God created him to do. That before Noah can ever start building, it first starts with God entering into the life of Noah with an act of grace. Verse 22, and the easiest thing in the world, right? And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. The easiest thing, oh, 
God says to do this. Psh, easy, right? Everybody say, no. <laughs> Reading this story, these eight words that Noah did everything just as God commanded him, it actually represents around 65 years of Noah building. For 65, around 65, it's not an exact number, around 65 years, all Noah has is a word from God to build this ark, and Noah decides to build it. How difficult could it be to hear a word from God and then to act on it for 65 years before it ever begins to flood, before it ever begins to rain? And what I love about this series is that we started with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that were visible. The word that God gave to Noah was not seen. But what was not seen, this word results in an ark. The grace was not seen in this story. You can't have a bottle of grace, but Noah is building on top of this grace. So what I want us to understand today is that faith, when God speaks something and we trust him at his word, that it is the faith and the trust that that leads to the results that we see in our life. It is our confidence in God that leads us to the things that he would have us do. Noah builds for 65 years. And what I love about this story and many stories in the Bible is we get to see over and over and over again what happens when God speaks to his people and they trust in him by faith. We see that after 65 years that we have another note in Genesis 7, 5, and Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. See, all Noah had to do was follow. All Noah had to do was hear and follow. And we understand that in this story that Noah had everything that he needed in order to follow God faithfully. And there's an important principle that I love in this story, and it's simply that God's way is the best way. God's way is the best way. What we see with Noah and his obedience is that doing things God's way will always lead to the best results. And I was reading through this this sermon and we're covering around three chapters of Genesis. So I'm like, man, we've got to jump through real quick. But as I'm reading, it's like every few words, it feels like God is showing so much that we could pull from, from today. And today I want us to pull three quick ideas and we're to come back and make it all connect together. But the first point that I want to make As we look at Noah's story, especially in light of him building for 65 years, point number one, everybody say, don't give up. Now look at somebody next to you and tell them, don't give up. And everybody look back at me. Look back at me. Because I bet, first of all, tell me, don't give up. Thank you. Second of all, You might be sitting next to somebody that's on the verge of giving up today. You might be sitting next to someone that's on the verge of quitting. And what's beautiful about the church is that God often speaks to us, not always directly through the Bible, not always directly through the Holy Spirit, but sometimes God will speak to us next to the person sitting right next to us. And that means that you actually might be God's mouthpiece today. So I want you to look again at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. Look them in their eyes and tell them, do not give up. Now look to the other person and tell them, do not give up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the idea. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. At the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not 
give up. Imagine for a second that I went and I bought a vineyard. I say, all right, I'm going to get a million dollar loan. I'm going to have the best vineyard in Middletown, New York. Like Middletown has never seen a vineyard like Smith Vineyards. And I go, I get everything that I need for this vineyard. I buy the property. I till the soil. I go, I plant the seeds. It waters. And I'm like, great. I'm going to go inside, watch an episode of my favorite show on Netflix, and I'm going to come back and harvest. And I go in the house. I watch my show. It's over. And I walk out to the field. I'm like, where's the harvest? I planted these seeds an hour ago. Where's my harvest? So you know what? I need to go to sleep. I'm going to go to sleep, sleep it off, wake up. I go out the next day in the morning. Where is my harvest? God, it's been six hours. Where is the harvest? And then I go another week. I say, you know what? This, this, this whole harvest thing, this system is broken. It doesn't work. And then if I'm ready to quit and I have an attitude and I start packing up all my stuff, and then someone who's planted and harvested before comes and talks to me. And I tell them, I listen, man, I can't do this farming thing. The harvest doesn't work. You know what the farmer's going to say? Did you give it time? Did you give it time? The farmer's going to say, do not grow weary in doing what is right. For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest when you don't give up. The reason why the Apostle Paul is using the image of a harvest is by virtue of the society and culture, you understand that a harvest takes time. In the case of Noah, it was 65 years. He had to do what was right for 65 years until he saw the harvest. So I want to encourage you today, don't give up. Do not quit before it is harvest time. The second thing I want us to understand today is that God does what we cannot do. That God does what we can't. We see in this story that God gives Noah the instructions to build the ark. And eventually it starts to rain. It says that the, the heavens and it's like the earth, like it opens up. And it's like, all right, it's time to start loading up the boat. And the animals are going in, and the family is going in, and the door of the ark is left wide open. How many of you know that a boat's not going to float with a big hole in the side of it? The door of the ark was wide open. God, are you serious? You tell Noah to build this boat 65 years. Like, think about that, 65 years. When I'm building a piece of furniture from Ikea, 65 minutes, I'm done. I'm like, Lord, this is too hard. I'm done. I'm done. 65 years, he builds this ark, and the door is left open. Genesis 7, 15. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. So in the midst of this grand plan that God has, when it came down to the moment when God was needed, what does God do? He shows up. It says here that the Lord shut him in. You know, sometimes we need to thank God, not only for the open doors, but for the doors that he closes. Like God closes a door and we're trying to get out to the flood to drown. Like, let me in. Right? That sometimes and there's moments where we are stuck that God is going to show up and do what is best. Now, was Noah supposed to shut the door? Was his son supposed to create a pulley system where they can cut a rope and drop a weight and the door would shut? Was it because it was raining, the garage door opener stopped working and they're pushing the button? We don't know. Definitely not the last option. But what we do know is this, that when Noah needed help from God, that God showed up. In our own lives, I want us to understand today that when we need help from God, that God will always show up. Think about it. We were dead in our trespasses. 
There is nothing that we could do to make ourselves right with God. And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. God always makes a way. We see it in the life of Jesus. We see it in the life of Noah. And I want to encourage you today that you're going to see it in your own life, that God shows up for you. And my third point today, where I really wanted to get today, is seize the second chance. Seize the second chance. What do you mean, seize the second chance? How does that connect us to the story of Noah? Well, in order to understand this, we have to go back to week two of our series when we're talking about God creating humanity in his image. Genesis 128. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. So we see in the book of Genesis, as we started this series, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That was good. Genesis 1. We see in Genesis 1, in the second part of our series, that God created us in his image, and that is good. And then we get to Adam and Eve. And we see a little mistake happen with this fruit, the pumpernickel tree, right? In the garden. And we see that Adam and Eve, that they eat this tree, eat the fruit of this tree. And from that moment where they ate the fruit, we see from Genesis 2 up until this point of the story that sin begins to spread. Think about it. In Genesis early on, we see that they ate the fruit. And we learn later on that sin and death entered in through Adam, through this one moment. But then by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, that every single human was set only on evil. So this problem called sin, it spreads that it's spreading and it's going exponentially, that it's getting worse and worse and worse till every human heart, except in this story, bar Noah, is set on evil. So God tells Adam and Eve in the garden, he says he created the male and female, do all of these things. God floods the earth. He removes the sin in an act of justice. And then we get to Genesis chapter nine, verse one, and listen to the instructions that God gives to Noah. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. What if this story was about a second chance? What if Adam and Eve messed up? The sin spread into the world. God takes care of the sin problem. He gets rid of the sin problem. And then through Noah's family, he says the exact same instructions that he tells to Adam and Eve. Listen, the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds on the sky, on every creature that moves along the ground and on all of the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Just as I gave you the green plants, there's no, there's no evidence to Noah that God says to Noah, I'm giving you green plants. But we do see it in Genesis with Adam and Eve, that God, he's expanding, that God, he's giving to Noah. He's saying, I want you to do this. I want you to make this right. And I now give you everything. You see, the flood story is not about what was destroyed. It's about what was restored. The flood story is not about what God destroyed. It's about what God restored. Think about it. This story doesn't end with the flood. How easy is it to say, see, they got what they deserved. They got what they deserved. And you stop the story there. 
It's like, no, really? We all deserve the flood. We all deserve to be cut off. But what we see as we keep reading this story, that on the foundation of the grace that was given, that Noah once again has the instructions to be fruitful and to multiply. If we stop this story with the flood, it's like stopping an Easter service with Jesus dying on the cross. You don't just stop at the flood. You, you, you don't even stop. You continue through the new beginning. We don't stop our Easter celebration on Good Friday. We end on Sunday by celebrating the victory that Jesus Christ won on the cross. This story is a story of second chances. And I know I jumped a lot throughout this story, but I did all that today because I wanted us to see this. That it says that Noah found grace with God. But it says later on that Jesus came full of grace and truth. We see that Noah was righteous, that he walked righteous before God. But we see for us that Jesus Christ himself, he is our righteousness. We see that God approaches Noah with a covenant, but that Jesus Christ by his blood, that he is the new covenant. And I'm saying this to say this, that sometimes stories can only be understood by looking at it backwards. The same way that I, I had my opening story where I looked at my life and I was like, oh my goodness. I had no idea all of the favor that was going on again. That sometimes we can read these Bible stories and we have to realize that God's favor is not just in the New Testament, but that it's all throughout the scripture. That it's one continuous story. And as we look at Jesus Christ and we look at this story of Noah, I want us to understand today that the story is still going on, that God is still delivering his people, that God is still working in the world. You know what's different and what's harder about how God is working? That many times now God is working directly through us. And it's easier to sit back and say, God, you, you do it. You go ahead. You go ahead. But we see in this story and many stories in the Bible that God is going to do what he's going to do. But that he's actually empowered us to be a part of this story. We see in this story that God ends it with a sign, a signal of his covenant. Verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So we see that Noah, as he receives this covenant, that he also receives a sign, which is to be his, his way to remember the covenant that God made with him. Does anyone know how Jesus tells us to remember the covenant that he makes with us? What's it called? communion that Jesus says do this in remembrance so the same way that we see in the story of Noah that God is saying this sign is for you to remember God has given us a sign to remember and that is through communion we also see as we look into scripture through and through that when God is faithful to the covenant, that he gives us something to seal that covenant. And for us, it ends with the person, the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that seals us for the day of redemption. So today, as we conclude this sermon, I want to end with this. It was my first point. Don't give up. Don't give up. I don't know how many times in the 65 years where I don't know if Noah was being made fun of. I don't know if his kids were lazy and he was doing all the work while they're playing Xbox. I don't know if anyone thought he was crazy. I'm sure the act of building an ark is going to be exhausting. But Noah was able to continue because of the grace that first found him. So if you're trying not to quit and you're trying to like giddy yourself up and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, bootstraps, relax, rest in God's grace. 
rest in God's grace. It is God who strengthens you. It is God who keeps you. It is God who sustains you. Like the whole time. Like as you're on the verge, you're like, all right, if I get down to a one, I'm going to quit. God's there at a two, like, I got you. Like he's been the one that's holding you up the whole time. So simply rest in him. And if you're here today and you're saying, okay, I've heard of God's grace, but I, I don't think I've encountered it before. I don't think that I've ever made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. Well, first of all, you probably have because God's grace, it finds you. We don't find grace. His grace finds us. But secondly, we love to end every service with an opportunity to give our lives to Jesus, to profess our faith in him. And we do that by praying a prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Change me. Make me new. I will serve you with this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.